Harvard Kennedy School Dean David Elwood and Professor Merrily Grindle. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the Dean of the uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. I must say we don't often have forums at 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon for the very good reason that no one ever comes. Uh, this is clearly evidence uh, of something else. In addition, in all the years that I've been Dean, and there have been quite a few, I have never seen a forum start early. Uh, and so this, I think, is a testament to the kind of efficiency and quality of government that we have experienced in, uh, in Chile uh, under this president's leadership. So I am certainly delighted to welcome President Piñera and the First Lady here to the Harvard Kennedy School. Really, I should say, welcome them back to Harvard, since, as Mary Lee will uh, go on to say, he is a graduate of this esteemed university, and we are thrilled to have him here. We're also so pleased to have so many people from Chile here with us today and remarkable students uh, also of uh, both the Kennedy School and the larger university uh, down in Chile. And thank you also to, to the ambassador of Chile, uh, Artur, Arturo Fermin-Dois, for his uh, extraordinary work in, uh, in everything we've done here, uh, and to Jorge Dominguez, the vice provost for international affairs. Now, before I turn the podium over to Marilee Grindle to do our introduction, I do want to just say a couple of words which I always say on the occasion of uh, speakers of this significance. For over 30 years, uh, we have been privileged here at the Kennedy School in this forum to welcome some of the most remarkable uh, leaders and speakers uh, in the world. Some are controversial. Uh, all have a remarkable set of activities and things to discuss and describe. We have learned a great deal for them. We do have one and only one absolute ground rule here at the Kennedy School when someone comes to speak, and that is if they speak here, they must take free and unfettered questions from the audience, and we have microphones. That will happen. And in exchange for that, we ask that the audience listen and be respectful during the time when the speaker is speaking. If you are unable to uh, maintain that simple rule here, uh, you'll be asked to leave. Uh, we are all here to hear this, uh, to, to hear the speaker, and you will have your chance to ask questions uh, at the end. So uh, let me just say a couple of words, uh, first of all, about the president. I am particularly pleased to have him here because last um, spring, I, along with President Faust and others, had the remarkable opportunity to go and visit Chile, and uh, we were there to celebrate a fellowship and other activities, and Donica Luksic. Uh, who has made it possible for a remarkable group of people to come and participate here. But it, we happen to be very clever in our choice of the timing, and it happened to be precisely the moment when Barack Obama was visiting Chile. Um, so uh, it was a rather busy time, and yet the president was very generous in seeing us on the very day that President Obama was there and even included us in the, uh, in the evening's uh, state dinner. Uh, so, uh, Mr. President, I am very much gratified for both your courtesy, but also for the, the, the very, very interesting conversation that we had an opportunity to do. But the more formal introduction, let me turn now to Professor Marilee Grindle. She is the Edward S. Mason Professor of International Development here at the Kennedy School, and she's the director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. She is indeed a specialist on the comparative analysis of policymaking, implementation, and public management in developing countries with a particular reference to Latin America. Uh, she has a great number of books, and I'm not going to list them all, but they include everything from Growing Local, uh, growing local democratiz I mean, Decentralization, Democratization, and the Promise of Governance, uh, to Audacious Reforms, Institutional inven Invention, and Democracy 
democracy in Latin America. And obviously she's written many articles and other kinds of things. What I would also say about Mary Lee as head of the David Rockefeller Center, she has been a tireless champion of establishing close, effective working relationships, a mutual learning, and as well as a flow of students in places around the world, including and very, effect and very intensely in Chile, where there's a major, uh, one of the major uh, um, homes of the David Rockefeller Center. So it is with very great pleasure that I give to you Marilee Grindle, <coughs> Edward S. Mason Professor. Thank you very much, David. Um, it is a pleasure to have David Elwood as my boss. I am very honored to have the opportunity to introduce the President of the Republic of Chile, Sebastián Piñera Echenique. We are fortunate at the Harvard Kennedy School, at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, and across Harvard University to have multiple connections with Chile through our students, through our faculty, and through a host of collaborative relationships that we have with institutions in your country. In the past two years, Chile has been much in the news. The devastating earthquake suffered by the country in February 2010, the saga of the 33 miners trapped deep beneath the earth that was followed by hundreds of millions of people around the world, and most recently, intense discussions of education reform. All of these have focused our attention on the country. President Piñera has experienced these events very firsthand. From March 2010, he has led reconstruction efforts. From August through October of that same year, he oversaw the almost miraculous rescue of the miners. And in the past few months, he's been deeply engaged in charting the future of education in his country. Many, many years from now, he will have a fascinating and adventure-filled memoir to write for all of us to read. Of course, we know that Sebastian Piñera is no stranger to Harvard. After receiving an engineering degree from the Universidad Pontifica de Chile, he earned a PhD in economics from this university. President Piñera has had a successful career in business and has been active in public service as the founder of important organizations such as the Mujer Emprende and the Futuro Foundation, and contributing effectively to the Hogar de Cristo, all of these initiatives that have focused on the social and economic development of his country. In his concern for public policy issues, he has worked in and advised important international organizations and the Chilean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. As a senator, he dealt with critical issues of public finance, human rights, health care, the environment, and political reform. Then in January 2010, he was elected to be the 47th President of the Republic of Chile, and he took office in March of 2010. President Piñera's biography says that, and I'm quoting, in his spare time, he likes to be with his family and friends, enjoying all kinds of outdoor activities, sports, and cuisine. I don't imagine that you have very much spare time these days, Mr. President, but as a frequent visitor, to your wonderful and beautiful country, I can think of few places in the world more perfect for enjoying family and friends and outdoor activities and sports and good food. You have chosen your leisure activities very well. Welcome back to Harvard, Mr. President. We are honored to have you with us. Bienvenido.
Thank you very much, David and Merli. Really, for me, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Let me tell you something. Every time I come to Cambridge, I get very nostalgic. Because with my wife, and she's here, we remember those happy days when we were adult enough to be owner of our own lives and at the same time young enough to be really free. And let me tell you something. My first class day at Harvard was September the 11th. Not your September the 11th. It was September the 11th of 1973, which is a very special day for us. That day we lost our democracy. Until then, Chile was the second longest democracy in the world after the U.S. At that time, we had a coup d'etat, and we lost our democracy for 17 years. I remember that I arrived to Litauer Library, and a professor, which after that I knew it was Professor Kenneth Arrow, Nobel Prize, asked me, are you a Chilean? Yes. I said, look, something terrible happened in your country. I came back to my apartment, and I saw TV, and I saw something that really surprised me because the Air Force planes were, were bombing our White House. And I started merely calling my girlfriend. And it was impossible, because all the lines were cut down. Finally, at 3 a.m. in the morning, I reached her. And my first reaction was, let's get married. <laughs> and she said, yes, and here we are, four children, four grandchildren. So it was an emotional reaction and turned out to be the best decision I've made in my life. Let me tell you something about the world, Chile and Latin America. First of all, we all know that the world is living a new era, so different from the era that we knew. In the last two or three decades, a new world has emerged so different from the 20th century world that we knew. And together with this, two very significant wars have fallen. Not only the Berlin Wall, which separated the world between the East and the West, and you know that th those were two different worlds, and they could not agree on anything. Different approach to life, to democracy, to development, and to everything. But there's another war that also fought. This second war went from East to West and separated the north, where the developed countries were, from the south, where the poor countries were. Unfortunately, Latin America and Chile were in the southern part of the world. But that's over. And right now, we feel that we have our best chance as a country and as a continent to achieve what our parents always cherished, but never accomplished, which is basically to transform Chile into a developed country without poverty, with equality of opportunities, before the end of this decade. So it's a project for our generation. And we are really working hard to achieve that goal. And we have something else that is going in our favor. The revolution of the new society that has emerged, the society of information, knowledge, intelligence, technology. We arrive late to the Industrial Revolution. And that's why Latin America is an underdeveloped continent. We will not arrive late to this new revolution, which is much more powerful than the old ones. Latin America is celebrating its first 200 years of independence. Most of Latin American countries got their independence at the beginning of the 19th century. And after 200 years of independence and republican life, we need to ask ourselves, have we really been able to take advantage of all the possibilities that our continent gave us? And the answer is no. Latin America has had it all. Vast territory, a very generous natural resources. We didn't have to, to deal with world wars like those that crossed Europe during the last century, or Russian conflicts like those that still occur in Africa, or people killing themselves in the name of the same God, like in countries like Ireland, 
and in the Middle East. Nothing of that has occurred in Latin America. And yet, having all in our advantage, we have not been able to fulfill our goal. That's why we think that the time is now for Latin America to recover the lost time and to do what is our duty and to perform our mission, which is simple. We need to recover the time we lost. That's why, as President of Chile, our main target, and this was the main platform in our campaign, was to transform Chile with the help of and the participation of all the Chileans into a developed country without poverty, with equality of opportunity, before the end of this decade. And this is a very difficult task. Chile was the poorest Spanish colony in Latin America. Only the really brave one dared to get there because everything was in, in Peru and nothing in terms of wealth and gold and all what the Spanish were looking for was in Chile. And therefore to transform Chile from the poorest Spanish colony to the first Latin American country able to achieve those goals is a very difficult task. It's a very ambitious task. But I'm absolutely convinced that it's an absolute feasible task. Why? First of all, because we have already uh, advanced quite a bit. Chile by now is the country with the highest per capita income in Latin America, 15,000. The average in Latin America is less than $10,000 per capita per year. So we have already accomplished many things, but we are still halfway. And those of you that are mountaineers know very well that the second half, when you are climbing a mountain, is the most beautiful one, but is by far the most difficult one. So that is our task. We have a very open economy. Chile, more than 70% of our GMP is related to international trade. It's a much more open economy than the U.S. And we have free trade agreements with 58 countries in the world. I think that only maybe Israel and Mexico can say something similar. Those 58 countries represent more than 80% of the population, of the world population, and more than 80% of world GNP. We have free trade agreement with the US, with Canada, with Europe, with China, with India, with Japan, with Korea, and we can go on and on uh, because really we have almost free trade agreement with every country in the world that believe in free trade. So I remember very well that at a given point in time, the Chilean experience was known as the Chilean miracle. It was a 12th period, a 12 years period, that were called the Chilean miracle, the fat cow period, because everything went well for our country. From 87 to 98, 1987 to 1988, the Chilean economy was able to grow at more than 7% per year on average. So we were able to more than double our per capita income during that period. That was a time when we catch up and we transform our country from one of the poorest in Latin America to the most developed country in Latin America. We were creating employment, investment was going up, export were going up, we were opening up our economy, signing free trade agreement with many different countries, and at the same time, during that period, we were able to recover our democracy, which is the natural way of life of the Chilean people. And it wasn't easy, because after 17 years of a military government, normally, when all those transitions from military government to a democratic government are in the middle of political crisis, economic chaos, social violence. Nothing of that happened in Chile. We had the wisdom to realize that the only way to construct a real solid and sound economy and real solid and sound democracy was by reaching agreements. And we did it. So we changed the logic of confrontation for the logic of dialogue and agreements. And that was probably a most important change that happened in my country. But something happened after that, because in 1998, with the financial crisis of that time, and we are getting financial crisis every time uh, 
more, deeper and, and more often. Something happened in Chile and we lost that momentum. We lost that leadership. We lost the will to become a developed country. And from nine, 1998 until 2009, we live another 12-year period, which was not the Chilean miracle. Some people told, called it the Chilean nap or lean cows because the growth rate went down by half, our capacity to create employment almost, also went down by half, investment went down, productivity went down, and therefore the country started to lose its possibility of becoming a developed country able to give opportunity to everybody to really take advantage of the talents that God has given to all of us and perform their mission in this world. That's why I remember very well once in England I heard Margaret Thatcher saying, let's make Great Britain great again. And that was the kind of message that we tried to transmit to the Chilean people during the 2010 campaign. Because after 20 years of the same coalition governments, we was, were able to win the election democratically and therefore win the right to lead our country in this new era. We have been in power 18 months. Have, they have been very special 18 months. First of all, 10 days before we took office, Chile was hit by the fifth worst earthquake in the known history of mankind. It was a devastating one. We lost not only hundreds of lives, but we lost one out of every three schools, one out of every three hospitals. We lost thousands of airport, ports, bridges, and many, many, uh, many, many other private and public investment and wealth. And let me tell you something. That earthquake cost us not only hundreds of lives, but also 20% of our GMP. Let me put it just in, perfect, in perspective. The Katrina uh, phenomenon cost the US, the US less than one-tenth of one percent of the U.S. GMP. In our case, it was 20% of our GMP, just to put it in, in, per, in perspective. Ten days after that, we took office. I remember that the day, of, the day of the inauguration, the inauguration day, everybody was there, president from all over the Latin America and many other parts of the world, and that same day, while we were swearing in, we had to suffer three more earthquakes. And I remember the face of the Latin American president, because you know people when they are facing trouble. Some of them stay very calm. Other people run out of the, of the room to save their lives. And that was the way we started our government. That's one thing, the earthquake and the tsunamis, many tsunamis that came immediately after the earthquake. The second very special event of the last year was that we celebrated our first 200 years of independence. The third was the mining accident. I remember, remember perfectly well when I was informed that 33 miners had been trapped seven, 2, 000, more than 2,000 feet below the earth in a small mine in the driest desert of the world, which is the Atacama Desert. I, I was in Ecuador at that time, and I came back immediately to my country, and I went and I met the wives, daughters, mothers, fathers, sisters of the miners. And they were very des desperate and with a lot of anguish because nobody knew whether they were alive or dead. Nobody knew where they were. Nobody knew how to find them or unless how to rescue them. I remember that I told them only one thing. Look, I commit myself and my government that we will look for them as if they were our own sons. And we honor those words. After eight, 18 months in, in government, the results are there. The growth rate of the Chilean economy that on average was 2.7% during the last government has been 8.4% during the first semester of this year. We have been able to create almost half a million jobs in our first year in government. That's equivalent to 15 million jobs created 
in the U.S. in one year, if you compare the size of the two countries. Wages have been going up by 3% per year. Exports have been growing at more than 20% per year. The same thing with investment productivity, which was negative, and therefore it was a drag on our growth capacity, has become positive, and it's helping us reaching our goals. But we are fully aware that despite these results, we are still halfway in our mission to transform Chile into a developed country. And let me tell you something. There is something which has been called the middle income trap. What it means, only a few countries, and I can count them with the fingers of one hand, have been able to make the transition from poverty to develop, development. During, between the 60s and today. Japan, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, and another country that I am missing right now. <laughs> Probably it's, it's uh, Taiwan. Only five. All the others that have tried to do that transition and cross that desert that separates the developed world from the and the developed world, as we were called before, now we are, calling develop, we are called developing world. Because it's a very hard to cross that desert, for many, many reasons. First of all, people think that we have already got it, and that we have already reached the summit, and it's not the case. And they start forgetting what has to be done in order to continue moving in the right direction. And people start willing to leave us if they were rich, while we have not yet reached that status. And therefore, we are fully aware that we will have to do our best efforts during the next decade in order to achieve that goal. Because we normally would rely on the old pillars, where Chile has always been very strong, a very stable democracy, and a market open, competitive, and integrated economy, and a state that is very, is in, in relative terms, is a very transparent and honest state. But that's not enough. Today, in order to become a developed country, we need to do much more than that and much better than that. That's why we think that we will have to build the new pillars of real development, which are very simple. And you just have to analyze the experience of those countries that has been, have been successful to realize what are those new pillars. First of all, we need to do a major change in our educational system to improve quality, coverage, finance, and access at all levels, at the scholar level, at the university level, because that's the matter of all the battles. And we will lose or gain our battle for the future and for development in the educational sector. The other pillars are, of course, that we need to triple our investment in science and technology, we need to promote innovation and creativity because that's the only real renewable and inexhaustible source of growth. And we need to get rid and defeat poverty and really be able to build a society with real equality of opportunity, with more justice, fairness, and respect for everybody. So we are really working on those four areas and maybe if you are interested in that, in the question time, we can address some of these issues. I would like to finish my, my remarks by sharing with you what are our main concerns. What keeps us at, up at night? And there are many things. First of all, the international economy. Because we realize that something very wrong is happening with our international economy. When we, when we saw that the U.S., the biggest economy in the world, was at the blink of default and has not yet been able to reach an agreement to face its problem, that's something that concerns not only the Americans, but everybody in the world. The same thing is happening with Europe. Europe has not been able to sort out the, 19, uh, the 2008 crisis and is slagging, slagging behind and many people think that they will have to face a new recession. And something else that bothers us is that in this new world we have to face new problems and we don't have an international governance strong enough and effective enough to face the new challenges that we will have to face. Not only global warming, but also how to face this economic crisis that are occurring every time 
a, a, in a more stronger and often way. How to deal with our main enemies like terrorism, a, organized crime, drug trafficking? How to fight poverty and starvation and protect our, our environment? No country in the world can do it by itself. Only together we will be able to face this problem. And we don't have the right kind of governance. We need to change the structure of our institutional, international institutions, starting with the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, that we're creating after the Second World War. And we are living now in such a different world, and we still have basically the same kind of international institutions. That's another thing that worries us and should worry everybody. The third thing is that we are hearing in my country Merry-made songs. A lot of people are thinking that everything has already been accomplished and now we have to check in and start getting all the benefits right now immediately for everybody. And that's not the case. We still have a long and hard work to do in order to become a real developed country in an integral way. Not only in terms of per capita income, it's much more than that. It's in terms of the kind of institution that we have to build the strength of our democracy, the equality of our income distribution, the care that we have to take with respect to our environment, and the respect of human rights, and so many other things. And always there are some impatient people that think that everything has to be obtained immediately, right now, for everybody. And that's something that a government, a responsible government, will have to resist. And it would be very easy to say yes to all what is being asked in my country right now. Actually, Chile doesn't have a public debt. Actually, we have a negative public debt. And we have 20 billion in savings in banks around the world. And after what we've been hearing today and the day before, we are worried about those deposits. <laughs> but so it will be very easy to spend all our savings, mm? and to, but that would mean that would be the wrong decision. Bread for today, hunger for tomorrow. So we need Keep convincing people in Chile that we are still halfway. We have to work hard for a long period of time to become a developed country. Because otherwise, we will also be trapped in what is being called the middle income trap, where you can come back to your original position or stay there forever, which has been the case of most countries that have tried to attempt this. That's why in this new world, of course, with new risk, new threats, new dangers, new problems, but also in this new world we have new horizons, new opportunities like never ever before, especially for a country like Chile. A small country in the end of the world, separated by, by the, uh, from the rest of the world by the driest deserts in the world, the highest mountains in the world, the biggest ocean in the world. But we are, are very lucky because you know that the center of the world which was the Mediterranean at a given point in time, the Atlantic after the Second World War. But now the center of the world is the Pacific Ocean. That's why we are working with the U.S. in trying to promote what has been called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which will be a free trade zone with countries at both sides of the Pacific Ocean. And that will be the biggest and strongest free trade zone in the world. And I had the chance to talk yesterday with President Obama about this because we will meet, the APEC will meet again in Honolulu by the end of this year and that will be the right time to take a big jump ahead in this initiative. So finally, I remember an American who once said there are two kinds of people in the world. Those that see the world as it is and ask why and those that dream with the world as it should be and ask why not. And we need more people with this, that second approach in Chile in order to be able to do and to accomplish what has been the dreams of all the former generation but has never been accomplished. And at the end of the day, as Saint Saint Augustine said, the times are made by men and women. So if we want better times, we have to have better people. And therefore, we are very happy because today in the morning we were able to 
to make a big jump ahead in an agreement that we will want to sign, strategic alliance between Massachusetts and Chile, based on three areas, energy, education, and technology. And we hope that next year we will be able to sign this strategic alliance with the state of Massachusetts, with the great state of Massachusetts. And I hope that that will be helpful for for the, for, for the state of Massachusetts and, of course, for Chile. So, we are still working. We know that we'll have to face very difficult times ahead, but you know that life has never been easy, and this is the time for brave people and not for people that will give up at, when they have to face the first obstacle. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm... Thank you very much. And David told me that one condition to, to be standing here was that I was forced to take all the questions, but he didn't tell me that I was obliged to give all the answers. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. President. It's a great pleasure, and thank you for your, your thoughtful words. We now do have a time for questions, and there are microphones located in four locations, one right here, one there, another there, and one there. We'll just go from one microphone to the next. Let me just remind everyone the characteristics of a good question here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Good questions have three characteristics. First, you start by introducing yourself. Second, a, que a, a, a question here is a short set of words with one thought in it. The third is it ends with a question mark. And with those three stipulations, let me start right over here. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Inigo Adriasola, and I'm an art historian. Um, I have a question for you, sir. Um, I, I was very pleased with your speech yesterday before the General Assembly, um, but I was slightly confused by one point. Uh, during your speech, uh, you said, you talked a bit about the student movement just as you did today, and you referred to the cause as a great, noble, and beautiful cause, if my memory doesn't, doesn't betray me. Uh, now, I must say that I was fairly surprised because that is not what the Chilean government has been telling the students in Chile. On the contrary, uh, it has been saying the exact opposite. It has either belittled their demands or uh, demeaned them, or just plainly ignored them, and suspended the right to assembly, in some cases, extremely forcefully repressing their gatherings. So uh, basically my question is, is this, does this reflect a change in policy on your behalf? Will you uh, sit down with the students and listen, and listen to their demands uh, without any conditions as they have requested? Thank you, sir. One. American that ran for president of the United States once said that everybody, everybody has the right to have their own opinions, but not their own facts. So let me start by disagreeing with the facts that you have pointed out. First of all, we have never repressed the right to gathering or, or to protest because that's a constitutional right. And we also have our first amendment, and we are a very respectful respectful government, and particularly of the great law of <laughs> great law of the land. And therefore, students have manifested in the last four months more than 100 times in all the cities and streets of our country, and they were, have never been denied that permission. So the first fact that you point out, I think, is wrong. Secondly, we have never repressed them. Actually, there has been 550 people injured during the protest that have taken place in the last four months. 510 of them are policemen, and only 40 of them are civilians. So, of course, we have to keep public order because that's another responsibility. So, I think that you started with two wrong assessments, but let me go to the to the central part of your question. Of course, I think that the 
cost of improving the quality of education in Chile is a great, noble, and beautiful, and urgent cost. And we agree with that 100%. That's why our government is undertaking the major educational reform that should have been undertaken many years ago by the former governments. And we are doing that, even though we are not part of the problem. We want to be part of the solution to the educational sector in our country. But of course, we fully agree that we need to undertake a huge, a major, a Copernican reform of our educational sector. And we are doing that. I don't have the time here to express everything that we've done in terms of changing the system, the law, improving the financing, improving the quality. But there is one thing I would like to mention to you in this respect. We have committed all the resources necessary for this. Not only the normal budget of the Ministry of Education, but we have committed $4 billion on top of the regular budget in order to finance this major reform. $4 billion in Chile. You have to multiply that by, by 200 to compare that with an EUS, a U.S. figure. And we have some disagreement with the students. And I have no problem in a speak openly about those disagreements. They are asking for many things. One thing they are asking for is free education for everybody. We agree that we should guarantee free education at the lower levels, before schools, because there we can correct these inequalities before they become absolutely irreversible. At the school level, but at the university level, we think that education should be free only for those people that really need it. Because we don't think this is feasible and we don't think it's fair that we use taxpayers' money, particularly the taxes paid by the poorest, to finance the, educational, the education of the richest. And that's a disagreement. And in the democracy, we have to learn to live with disagreements. And the way to solve them is not with Molotov bombs or, or violence. The way to solve it is using our dem democratic system, which is what, what we have been proposing them from the very first moment. And the second difference and disagreement is that we believe that the government should never monopolize the educational sector in a country, because that would be a threat to freedom, to quality. And we believe that both the private sector and the public sector should participate in the educational sector. The government is responsible for the quality of both sectors. The government is responsible for financing through scholarship or loans to all those students that need those scholarships and loans, but the government doesn't have the right to take away from their parents the right to choose, or from the students the right to choose when, where, and what they want to study. Those are the two differences. So I still, I will repeat today once again that the cost to increase and improve the quality of education is not only a, a great, noble and beautiful cost, it's the main mission of our government. Next question is right up here. President Piñera, I am, a, I am Francisco Meneses. I am a middle class Chilean. Uh, my family has worked in four of your campaigns and I have worked one year and a half in your government. So I feel that I can make you a very complicated question. <laughs> uh, Chile has improved uh, a lot in the last 20 years economically and we have democracy and we have many freedoms. But there's one freedom that in practice we do not have the government does not guarantee and practice freedom of association. It is very difficult to make a new labor union in Chile. Students are kicked out of universities when they want to do an association. It's very hard and the government puts taxes you want to do, if we want to do a cooperative, a co-op. And it is really difficult to make a, co sorry, it's very difficult to make a collective trial without the explicit approval of the government and support. This is, has nothing to do with government. These laws were made by Pinochet to prevent civilians to organize themselves and rise against the military government. Is there a question would, here? Yes. We would love to enjoy the freedoms that people have in the Western world, Mr. President. So 
would you give us and grant us true and practical freedom of association and by doing that convert your current enemies in your allies would you change the laws made by the dictator that have barely changed during the last 20 years or would you keep things as they are right now thank you very much I think that without freedom, life is not worth living. So I fully committed with freedom. And let me tell you some good news. We have already changed the law that, that put a lot of difficult to collect trials. And so now everybody with the new CENAC, if you are aware of what is happening in Chile, people will be able to start collecting trials without the approval of anybody. But they all depending on their own will. That has already been done by our government. And we have already sent a law to Congress that will eliminate all the difficulties for students to be able to create their own organization, because in that point you're right. There were a lot of difficulties that came from the Pinochet regime. But let me tell you something. We are doing what should have been done 20 years ago. And therefore, I will take your advice, because I hope that by doing this, we will be able to transform our, our you said, adversaries? Enemies. Not enemies, because the enemies is a very hard and tough word. I will talk opponents into allies. So, thank you for your advice. Next question is right up here. Hi, um, my name is Juliana Terotua. Uh, I am uh, an undergraduate here. Um, I was wondering, in, uh, in another very fast-growing country in Latin America, in Panama, where I'm living right now, there is this sense that um, it's growing too rapidly for its own infrastructure, so uh, there are too many cars on the streets and there's not enough space in the actual streets, and so they're making uh, new roads and they have to cut through tourist, uh, tourist sites such as El Casco Antiguo. Um, is there, a, is there a, a concern that the same thing might be happening in Chile and what is being done to stop that? Yes. A very strong concern. Because we fully realize, let me tell you something, exports have been growing in Chile at least during the last year and this year more than 20% per year. If you take it, that into account and you compound that growth, it means that every four years we will be doubling our exports. Just an example to tell you what are the challenges that we will have to face in terms of infrastructure, for instance. And therefore, we will need to invest a huge amount of money in order to prepare our country to become a developed country. When, if you don't do that, it could happen what you are mentioning is happening in Panama. So we are fully concerned and very much concerned, but not only concerned, we are really trying to act on this. That's why we have almost doubled our investment in infrastructure. And fortunately, when you are growing at 8% per year, you are not only creating jobs like never before, but you are also increasing public revenues in a very substantial way. And therefore, we are getting the, the resource necessary to undertake the new challenges that we will have to face in the years to come if we want to honor our world and be able to transform Chile before the end of this decade in the first, and hopefully not the only, developed Latin American country. Thank you. Right over here. Muchas gracias, Presidente. My name is Jaime Besa, and I'm a Chilean student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. As you know, many of us Harvard students envision our careers serving in the public sector of our countries. For this reason, Many of us admired the risk you took in appointing two very young people in your first cabinet, Ena von Bayer and our, own, and, our, and our very own Felipe Gast. Unfortunately, due to different reasons, neither of them is currently serving there. My question to you is, what would be some of the lessons learned from this experience, but most importantly, what is your advice to people like us, young students from all over the world, so we can better prepare for taking significant roles in public office and succeeding in these positions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jaime. Well, ENA is now a member of our Senate. 
And Felipe Cast is in charge of a very, very important task for us. You know that after the earthquake, we lost. 220,000 homes. Our shelter or home deficit was 600,000. And in a few seconds or minutes, it went up to 820,000 because 220,000 homes were fully destroyed by the earthquake. And Felipe is in charge of that big mission. So we haven't lost. Ena, we haven't lost Felipe. They are just fighting or working in another position. But let me go to the, to the center part of your concern, which I am very happy that you have mentioned it, because we need the talent of young people. You know that life is, has always been a battle between audacity and prudence. You need both. I remember once Fittipaldi, which was a car race, a very famous Brazilian car racer, he said, I need both to win a, 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 a race. Because without audacity, I don't start the race. Without prudence, I don't end, finish the race. And I'm convinced that years can age your skin, but only when you lose your ideas, you age your soul. And for that, we need the contribution of young people. You are really a very privileged young Chilean because not only you are young, and that's enough, but you are <laughs> studying probably in the best university of the world. So let me tell you something. I invite you right now, as soon as you come back to Chile, to come to La Moneda, which is our White House, because we need your help. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question is right over here. Dear, Dear Mr. Yeah. President, thank you so much for joining us today at Harvard. My name is Paulo Sanger and I'm an undergraduate studying government. My question for you is on the failures of the international governance system, such as the United Nations and the World Bank that you mentioned in your speech. What do you believe the greatest faults with the system are? What is your vision for a better working international system? And what are the concrete <coughs> conditions? What are the concrete conditions that countries such as the United States uh, can help achieve to better our international system? Thank you. Your name is Paul? Paul. Well, Paul. I'm more convinced about the failures, the weakness and the problems of the international governance that we have today than about the solutions. But let me tell you what I think. First of all, I think that we have to change dramatically our international governance. For instance, what are we doing really with respect to the global warming threat? We have this Kyoto Agreement, which will end this year, and we haven't been able to reach a new agreement. And therefore, the, 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 the international governance is really failing in dealing with one of the main problems that we might be facing in the future, which is the global warming and all its consequences. We are not doing enough, and we all know that. And you know, in the last 30 years, we have destroyed more of our nature than in the whole history of mankind. And that can be proved very easily if you take into account how much uh, the forests that we have destroyed the biodiversity that we have destroyed, the contamination of the air, the ocean, the lakes, the rivers, and everything else. And what are we doing there? Each government, no matter how powerful it is, is not able to do this task, this task by itself. And we don't have the kind of international governance to deal with these issues. And there are many other things. We, for instance, right now we're in the middle of a crisis a financial crisis, an economic crisis, and many people think, among them, almost half of the e economy Nobel Prize, that we will have to face a new recession. And I was at the UN yesterday at the, at the day, yesterday at the day before yesterday, and most people are saying, who is taking care of this? Who is coordinating the world effort to overcome this tremendous threat of a new recession? 
And the answer is nobody. And people are very disappointed about what the UN is doing, about what the G20 is doing, and therefore, definitely, the world has changed so dramatically in the last 20 years that maybe a lot of people don't realize that we need to change the way we govern this new world because we cannot pretend to govern the new world with old institutions. So if we had time, we could talk much more about this, but there are a lot of changes that we have to make. I think at the end of the day, countries will have to give up part of their sovereignty, sovereignty in order to strength international governance. Because if each one of us is just looking for their own interests, which is what is happening in Cancun, in Copenhagen, in a few days we will have a meeting in Rio, which is called Rio Plus 20, because it was 20 years ago that we started uh, realizing the threats of what we, we were doing with our environment. And there is a lot of anguish because many people think that we won't be able to reach the agreements to move forward in this area. I remember a few years ago I saw a, a magazine, a U.S. magazine, I think it was the Time magazine, saying, let's save planet Earth. And I thought, it's not the planet that is in, in danger. It is our lives that is really in danger. Because the planet Earth has been able to resist many things. Many things, including the diluvio. How do you say diluvio? Uh, including the, the, the great flood, uh, 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 all kind of uh, uh, the, the, the glacier era. And what is really in danger is the human life in this planet. Because 99 out of 100 species that have ever existed, they don't exist today. And therefore, I absolutely convinced that the time is now and it is our responsibility, and I mentioned this at the UN, to really take in seriously that we need a new kind of international governance. Next question right up here. <clears throat> Good evening. I am Alejandra Matus, journalist and just graduated from this school as a Master in Public Administration. Um, Mr. President, uh, you said that um, there are um, causes or part of the cause of the students that you share and that some significant difference remain. Yesterday the students um, uh, made one of the biggest demonstrations in Chilean streets and a thousand of them are about to lose the year, the academic year. I wonder uh, if you have a plan, how are you going to solve this problem? How do you foresee this conflict is going to be resolved? It is true. I think it was yesterday, the march was yesterday. Yesterday, not today. And <laughs> I was afraid that there was a new march in Chile that I haven't been informed of. <laughs> Don't scare me to death, please. <laughs> there were 60,000 students marching yesterday, a huge amount of students. But let me tell you something. Only in the scholar system in Chile we have 3.5 million students. So there are three million four hundred and forty thousand students are going to school on a regular basis and we have to govern for everybody not only for those that are manifesting but we have always been ready as a boy scout to dialogue with the students actually a few weeks ago i invite them to come to la moneda which is our white house and have a direct meeting with the president and we had that meeting. And we find out at that meeting that there are many things where we fully agree and there are some aspects where we disagree. And there is nothing wrong with that. We shouldn't fear dissent or disagreement. How to solve those issues where we disagree in a state of, in a, in a, in a, in a country with a rule of law where we respect the major law the supreme law of the land, which is our constitution, there is a system for that. We have a Congress, so we can present our, our projects. They can present their own projects. And let democracy resolve. So the way as we think we should resolve our differences is very simple. Not by violence or by putting schools into fire or by using Molotov bombs. That's not the way. 
The way to solve is by dialogue, trying to convince each other, be ready to be convinced, to be convinced by the others. And if we finally don't reach an agreement, and I hope that we will restore our conversation very soon, if we don't reach agreement, very simple. In this country, there are many issues where you disagree. How do you solve them? In a democracy system, we have a system to resolve our difference, which is not violence, is democracy. We have time for just two more questions. Thank you for your, thank you for your inspiring words, President Pinera. My name is Steve Randazzo. I am a first year student at the Kennedy School of Government and also a former public school teacher here in New York, uh, from New York. Um, you mentioned that it is important for the United States to solve its debt problems uh, in order to secure world prosperity but also Chilean prosperity. And I want to know, uh, as an esteemed economist and also a world leader, um, what would you suggest to the President of the United States, as long as the, the federal government, um, to solve our debt crisis? And I, I hope that you will at least address, uh, if not other things, uh, the options of cutting back on federal spending and also uh, raising revenues through uh, increasing taxes. Thank you. Stephen. I remember when I was running for president that my advisor told me, don't get involved into internal politics of other countries because you have nothing to win and a lot to lose. But I will disobey that advice. I had the chance to talk this with President Obama a few days ago. And we had a long conversation when he visited Chile a few months ago. I'm convinced that the U.S. cannot keep running this huge fiscal deficit forever. And I think that everybody is convinced about that. So it has to be addressed. And there are only two ways to cut the fiscal deficit. Either you increase revenues or you decrease expenditures. And I let that to the American people. <laughs> this will be the last question. President Pinera, it's, uh, it's an honor to speak with you. My name is Anthony Ramacone. I'm a freshman here at the college. Uh, in recent years, Chile has really received a lot, of, uh, a lot of praise over its privatized pension system. And here in America, we've been having a lot of issues with Social Security. I believe yesterday in the Republican debate, Herman Cain even praised the Chilean model. I was, but there's also been a lot of labor pressure for more state spending within that model in Chile. So I was wondering, if you had any thoughts on that, and are there any plans to alter the Chilean pension model as it stands right now? Well, of course, there are many, many pension models. I think that the one we have in Chile is a good one. We used to have a pension system very similar to what you have here. Basically, you contribute to a blind fund, and at the end of, the, of, the, of your career, you receive from the government your pension. The problem is that that works very well when you have 10 million people working and only 1 million people uh, retire. But when, start get, when the people working start to go down, like in the U.S., and the retired people start to go up, like in the U.S., you will face problems unless you keep raising the contribution tax for the pension system. So we decided to change that system 30 years ago. And we moved from a public system where people had to contribute and there was no link between your contribution and what you were getting when, once you retired. And therefore, a lot of people started to pass laws. If I want to, be, uh, to become popular, I would say, okay, teachers, come here. You will not retire at 60. You will retire at 50 years old. I wouldn't pay a penny for that and I will get all the benefits. Somebody else will pay in the future. And therefore, we decided to change that, and we moved from a public system to a private system, in which everybody has to contribute a given percentage of the wage. And it goes to a personal account, his 
he owns that account. And when he retires, he will be able to get his pension, which will be financed by that fund that has been created by his own savings effort. And then intervenes only once. When you are retiring, if your savings are not enough to guarantee you a, a given pension, which of course will depend on the level of wealth and richness and income of, of the country, the government will subsidize you at that time in order that we will guarantee that everybody will receive a minimum pension consistent with the dignity that should be guaranteed to everybody. That's our system as of today. And therefore, nobody can manipulate the system. Because at the end of the day, I know that if I contribute more than what is legally uh, forced, I will get a better pension. If I retire earlier, I can do it. But I will get a lower pension. If I keep working after 60 years old for, the, for men and 60, uh, 60 for women and 65 for men, I will accumulate more funds and therefore I will get a better retirement. So it's a much freer system. But we can always remember that there has to be a solidarity aspect of the pension system. In our case, the solidarity component of the system is that when you are, when you are retiring, we will calculate the savings that you have been able to accumulate in your lifetime period of work. And if that's not enough to guarantee you a, a, how do you say, digna? Yeah, dignity. a dignity uh, or a minimum pension, we will the, the government, with the money of all the taxpayers, will subsidize you only once and will guarantee everybody that will receive a pension consistent with the dignity of human life. That's our system. I think it's a very good one. And I know that many presidents uh, of the U.S. have been, have been uh, analyzing the possibility of changing the system. But up to now, nobody has been able to do it. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been really my honor, <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you very much, and let me tell you something. I really envy you, because you are living probably one of the best parts of your life. So try to share your happiness, your idealism, your enthusiasm with people older than you, like me. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you very much. Thank, you very much Thank you very much, Mr. President, First Lady. Uh, I wish you all a very happy and safe uh, evening and weekend. Okay. Thank, Thank you.